Okay, today we're talking about chapter one, section eight, higher order derivatives. So it um, we we're going to take what we learned about getting derivatives, and we're just going to crank it up just a little bit. Okay, so that's not going to work. Or will it? No, it's not. Alrighty. So, uh, this is there it was. So higher order derivatives. So we have the derivative being f prime, f in the, the little comma there. f prime is itself a function that can be differentiated. For y is equal to f of x, the derivative of y prime is equal to f prime of x with respect to x is written as y double prime. Okay, so it's two. Isn't that we're looking at two of these? Y double prime, like that, right? Uh, or, or we could uh, think of it as the derivative, right, d dx, the derivative of f prime of x is equal to uh, f uh, double prime of y, or the second derivative of, I'm sorry, f double prime of x, or the second derivative of x. So this is called the second order derivative, or second derivative. It expresses the rate at which f prime of x is changing with respect to x. So if you recall, the derivative of a function is the rate of change. Okay. The second derivative is the change of the rate of change. Right? So if we have y is equal to f of x equal to uh, x to the fifth minus 3x to the fourth plus x, we know that, that the derivative of that is going to be 5x to the fourth minus 12x cubed plus 1. Okay? So that is the first order derivative. The second order derivative would just simply be taking that first order derivative and taking the derivative of that. Okay. And that's all we're basically doing. It's just we're taking the derivative of a derivative. And realistically, uh, at the end of the day, if you were given just a problem like this and asked to derive it, right? And and if you didn't even know if, it, if you didn't even know it was a, you know, well, I'm trying to make mark out the the prime there. You didn't even know it was a first derivative. You would think that we're just simply getting the the you know, in this case, you know, the first derivative of a function. So all we're doing is just taking the derivative of a derivative. All right, and um, so for higher order derivatives, we use a notation y to the n, or is equal to f to the n, right, to express the nth derivative. So on the previous page, we saw that we have the second derivative, right, uh, double prime there. We, we we stop with the with the prime notation after two, okay, just because it it gets a little out of control if we just start putting um, um, apostrophes everywhere. It's an apostrophe, right? That's not really an apostrophe. I don't know, but the the the, the prime symbol it gets a little out of control if we start putting the 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 prime symbol everywhere. But anyways, so what is the derivative of this? You can kind of do this off the top of your head, right? It's like 60x squared uh, minus 72x, and of course that would be the third derivative. And then the fourth derivative is taking the derivative of that, and then the fifth derivative taking the derivative of that, and then lastly, the sixth derivative would be just going to uh, zero because the derivative of a constant is uh, just zero. So the Leibniz notation for the second derivative of a function given by y is equal to f of x is the derivative of the derivative, right? If you recall, d dx is just the notation saying, hey, take the derivative of this, okay? And dy dx is the derivative of something, the derivative of the function y with respect to the variable x, right? Because we, we usually call our functions y and we usually name our functions x. So we say dy dx. So we're taking the derivative of the derivative or more succinctly, the second derivative d2 of y with respect to the derivative of x squared. And then for higher order derivatives, we can just simply do the same thing uh, depending on what uh, order derivative we're on. Right? And reads, these are read as the third derivative of y with respect to x, the fourth derivative of y with respect to x, and so on. Okay. Note that the superscripts 3 and 4 are not exponents. Uh, that's a big deal. So 
kind of how like uh, in the past you may have seen you may have seen something like something like this you may have seen something like that before right that doesn't mean that we're taking the uh, it's it's the function to the negative one exponent right that means the inverse function okay so so same principle uh, in mathematics we just kind of, we, we have to kind of reuse uh, a lot of our notation but the thing is everybody agrees upon this notation and so it's set in standard and so what I mean by that is in this particular case we, we, we denote that as the inverse function so everybody knows that an f the, the name of the function raised to a negative power negative one rather is the inverse function and in this case everybody knows that these right d to d cubed right there and dx cubed right there they're not necessarily exponents right it's just to the third we just say to the third it's not necessarily an exponent and by not necessarily an exponent i mean it is definitely not an exponent it just denotes the order of the derivative So this reads, for y is equal to 1 to the x, or I'm sorry, 1 over x, we need to find the second derivative of y with respect to x. Okay, well, first of all, we need to find the first derivative, right? So let's find the first derivative. So dy with respect to x, so the derivative of y with respect to x, okay, uh, let's just go ahead and rewrite this as uh, it's going to be a 1 and then x to the negative one, right? Because we want to get that that variable into the numerator, right? Well, now if we if we proceed with our uh, derivation process, right? We put the negative one out front, and then this goes down from negative one to negative two. Okay, and so you know we'll just keep that there this time. I I was I was looking over my videos last week, and I guess I could have probably kept them up there. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll just stick with that for right now. So anyways, so this turns into a negative one x to the negative two power, all right? Or in other words, it'll just simply be a negative and then a one over x squared, okay? That is the first derivative. Now the second derivative, okay? So we will write the second derivative of my function y with respect to my variable x, right, is going to be in a, yeah, yeah, that's good. All right, so we're going to have to do the same process here. We're going to go ahead and move the variable to the top again. Okay, and then we're going to do the process where we take this, well, we can take this, put this right here. And then that, that goes down to a negative three, right? We just we just subtract one. So it's going to be a negative two times a negative one is going to be a positive two x to the negative three power. And then that's going to end up being two over x cubed. Okay. And that's it. We, we, we take the derivative of a derivative. Right. And luckily it gets a little more complicated here. Not really. It's just we have to do uh, um, power rules and things like that. We have to be mindful of them rather. All right. So same thing. Let's do the, the first derivative here. So the first derivative of y with respect to the variable x, okay, and again, this, this will change, so in case you're wondering wh why we're writing this, okay? So imagine this function was, um, you know, a is equal to b squared plus two raised to six power, okay? Then that would be the derivative of a with respect to b. So that, 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 that's where the notation comes from. We, we, we're talking about the, what, the, what the name of the function is and the variable being used. And of course, that's what we see here. Alrighty. So let's, let's uh, 
get the derivative here? Well, we know from the, the chain rule, let's we'll go ahead and write this out, x squared plus 2 raised to the 6th power. We know from the chain rule we have to put the 6 out front, and this goes down to a 5, and then we have to take the derivative of the inside there. Okay. And if you're lost on that, um, you just, you, I, I record the chain rule video, I think, over the weekend. Watch that if you haven't already. Uh, but then, uh, and then we take the derivative of the inside, which is uh, which simply it's going to be 2x. So this turns into 5 times x squared plus 2 raised to the fifth power, and then we take the derivative of the inside here, all right, uh, and the derivative of the inside there is just simply 2x, so it's times 2x, okay, and of course we can rewrite, uh, we can, re we could rewrite that as, um, oh shoot, I didn't mean to say, I, I messed up there, that's not a 5, that's a 6. Sorry, I, I, I translate the 5 over there instead of bringing the 6 down. So we've got 6 times x squared plus 2 the raised to the 5th power times a 2x, or we could write that as 12x times x squared plus 2 raised to the 5th power. Okay. So that's the first derivative. And the second derivative is going to get a little messy, so let's go ahead and snip this and put this on the next page. Actually, let's take off the equal sign there. Okay. So now we're going to take the second derivative of y with respect to x. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take this 12 and just kind of put it out front, okay? And then we're going to take the derivative of what is inside the parentheses. So what I mean by that is we're going to essentially, it's going to look like this. We're going to have, we're going to say 12, and then we're going to take the derivative of what is, what, what is remaining, which is x and x squared plus 2 raised to the fifth power, okay? And of course, we know we, we can do that from our uh, derivation principles that we went over, I think, pretty much on the first day we talked about derivatives. Um, we, can, we, can, we can take the constant off and then uh, derive the actual variable. Well, looking at this, looking at this, uh, well, I'm taking the derivative of here, right? It looks like we're going to be using the power rule, right? This is the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first, okay? So... Let's begin. Uh, let's put it back down here. And honestly, it kind of bugs me that it's that I did that, so we're gonna move this also right here. Okay, so we're gonna say first times the derivative of the second. So it's going to x times the derivative of the second, which is gonna be five times x squared plus two. Uh, times the, the derivative of what's inside my parentheses, again, chain rule, which is going to be 2x, and then plus the second times the derivative of the first, which is just going to be x squared plus 2 raised to the fifth power, and then the, the derivative of the first, my x, is just simply 1, so we can stop there. I feel like I lost my parentheses somewhere. I guess I just put that there. Yeah, I think I think that's fine. Well, no, it just kind of looks weird, huh? Because I have a bracket there. So let's go ahead and just erase this bracket and make a parentheses. And then we'll fix this one. Brackets and parentheses don't re doesn't really matter. So it's, uh, it's just a way to keep track of of what's what. But anyways, now we can let's go ahead and clean this up just a tad. So we can multiply this x by this 2x, 
So that gets me 2x squared. So we're going to have 2x squared. That's what that's where I'm looking at. Okay, so I know I know I was messed up with a parenthesis somewhere. That five. It's supposed to look like that. Okay, sorry about that. So um, what I'm looking at here is, <clears throat> you see this, this entire thing right here is just it's simply one term. Okay, so it's essentially saying x times 5 times x squared plus 2 times uh, 2x okay and so with that I can say that we we're gonna have 5x times 2x is gonna be a 10x squared so we're gonna say 10x squared and then that's times x squared plus 2, right? And that cleans up the, the first term there. And, and the, the whole, well, I don't know, I guess it all being blue isn't, isn't terrible, right? And then um, to the fourth power, Charmin. And then we can just simply write the second term here. Rewrite it, rather. Okay. And then we're going to snip and continue this on the next page. And at this point, we just have a lot. Just uh, we just have to clean this up. Um, looking at my problem here, notice how this is my first term, and this is my second term. Okay, and all those nights, <clears throat> all those nights of mindlessly factoring your brains out, we're going is going to come into play here a little bit. Okay, because notice how we do indeed have an x squared plus two here and an x squared plus two here. So it appears we're going to be factoring out an x squared plus 2, right? Well, then we look at the powers there. Well, that's raised to the fourth. That's raised to the fifth. So we're going to raise out, or I'm sorry, we're going to pull out the, the common term there. And it's just going to be, we'll put this in green because the blue is kind of hurting my eyeballs. We're going to take the x squared plus 2 out, <coughs> and we're going to raise to the fourth power. So x squared plus 2 raised to the fourth power. We're factoring that out. And what remains, well, that would be, sorry. What remains is 10x to this uh, x squared, and then since we pulled an x squared plus 2 to the fourth out, nothing needs to be done there, and then we pulled out four of these, and there's, since there was five, just only one remains. Um, yeah. Right, and then we can we can clean this up even further and say we've got 12 x squared plus plus 4 raised to the fourth power and then uh, what I mean when we clean this up even more is because we just have a 10 x squared plus an x squared plus 2 right so that 10 x squared plus x squared gives me an 11 x squared plus 2 Whew, and that should be it <coughs> let me make sure we're good to go yeah. Okay, so all I did, I said all I did, this, that was actually pretty tedious, wasn't it? So getting the first derivative wasn't so bad. Getting the second derivative was, was a little bit of a pain because I had to do my power rule there, right? I had to do uh, first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. That's what we see down here. And then from there, I just I, I cleaned it up. And then honestly, um, most of this was, was just clean up process. So I did the computation. This line was a computational line. The cleanup process was everything after that. Who? Okay. That was just example two. Holy moly! It actually gets easier. All right. So next up is velocity and acceleration. So um, all those problems that you've seen. In, in textbooks and again I, when I was a student going through going through these courses uh, I was I was just kind of enthralled by well how do they know what exactly the, the the formula is for you know such and such well a lot of the physics problems are derived from what we're about to talk about here velocity and acceleration 
right? Whether it be, uh, well, not as I say whether it be, most most of the the gravity questions, right? The I'm shooting a cannonball from from the top of a mountain kind of questions. They come from this idea of velocity and acceleration, which has to do with calculus. So start from the tippy top here, velocity and acceleration. We have seen that a function's derivative represents an instantaneous rate of change. When the function relates distance traveled to time, the instantaneous rate of change is called speed or the velocity. Now, uh, in this particular text, we also call it speed, but it's largely referred to as simply just velocity. Okay. And I've noticed that this text does kind of interchange them, and I guess there's nothing wrong with it. It's just uh, outside of this textbook, velocity is used 99% of the time. So the letter V is generally used to stand for velocity. <coughs> Makes sense. So the velocity of an object, that is S of T, use uh, units from starting point at a time T is given by the velocity, or realistically, it's just going to be the first derivative. Okay. So... Um, and then the acceleration is going to be the second derivative, all right, or the first derivative of velocity. So that's that's what this is saying. So you have your you have your position, and then you have your uh, velocity, and then you have your acceleration. So let's um, let's mark that off. So you have your position function. Okay, it's not necessarily called position uh, in this textbook. I don't think, but uh, I, I I was looking ahead. I don't think I don't think that line of thought is really going to hurt you, uh, because you know obviously it does help to teach exactly what the book is trying to say. But at the same time, I don't think this one's going to hurt. Uh, and then the velocity is just is just the the first derivative, and then the acceleration is the second derivative. Okay, and that's really it. And so let's actually let's do it this way. We'll say the position. The position is just going to be some function. Some function x. The velocity is going to be the first derivative of that function. And the acceleration is going to be the second derivative of that function. Okay. And I think I think that's actually that's actually pretty good. And remember this. Uh, this is definitely something you want to put a put a put a star around or star on. Okay. Something you want to write down, because we, we, we come across that quite often. So let me do that. Oh, before we actually do dive into this example, uh, pr I probably should read that last sentence. Okay, so the last sentence is super duper important. So, it is important to use correct units in every real-world application. Since the velocity is the change in distance per unit of time, it has units miles per hour, right? That's our velocity, miles per hour, feet per second, meters per second, so on. That's the velocity, okay? And earlier I said that the second derivative is the change of the rate of change, right? So again, the rate of change what we're looking at uh, of a function is simply the first derivative. Now, if we take the rate, rate of change of the rate of change, that becomes the second derivative, okay? And and what that what that means is we are um, acceleration is a change of velocity per unit of time. So it is given in units such as miles per hour per hour, feet per second per second, meters per second per second, or you you would write it miles per hour squared, feet per second squared, and meters per second squared. And of course the 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 squared notation down there comes from the fact that if you have and we're just trying to Try to make this easy. So if you have miles per per hour, we'll just put mph or miles per hour, miles per m m o r h, right? And it was per hour. Okay. Well, if you if you um you know did 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 the arithmetic here, then that is indeed miles over hours squared. Okay. So that's why it looks like that. So example three reads, uh, from the point at which an object is dropped, the distance that falls in t seconds, so we're told that t is seconds, big deal, assuming negligible air resistance is approximately uh, at s of t, the function s of t is equal to 4.9 times t uh, squared. Okay. It says negligible, negligible air resistance, um, yeah, I don't think I have to really explain that, uh, but 
for the most part, I mean, things have a terminal velocity. Uh, what that means is there is a certain speed where you essentially stop accelerating. Uh, so we're going to assume that we have no air resistance here. So S of T is in meters. If a stone is dropped from a cliff, find each of the following, assuming the air resistance is negligible. So A, how far the stone has dropped five seconds after being dropped. So we are told in our function, in our function S of T is equal to 4.9 T squared, that T is time. Okay, so A is wanting to know how far the stone has fallen, or rather has traveled five seconds after being dropped. Okay, well S of T is going to be in meters, because that's what it says here, S of T. And let's just actually go ahead and underline that. S of T is in meters, and then T seconds. So it appears all we have to do is plug in the uh, the phi for T, and we'll figure out how far we've fallen. And that it's that easy. And of course, this is certainly a problem that you have, you have seen and done before. So S of 5 is going to be 4.9 times 5 squared. Right, and I don't really know what that is off the top of my head. No, it could be close to. So 25 times 4.9 is 122.5. So we have fallen 122. 1, 22.5 and we'll put in for meters. Okay. All right, next up, how, uh, B, how fast is it traveling? Okay, so now we're looking at the velocity. Okay, so we need to figure out how to get the velocity uh, after the five seconds it's been dropped. Well, the velocity, again, if we look over here on, well, on this page, all right, is just simply the, the first derivative. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to go ahead and, and point out that, again, acceleration is the second derivative, okay? Because we're going to be doing both the velocity and the acceleration. So we take the first derivative, so we're going to say, uh, we're going to take the derivative d, and then we're going to say d dt this time, right? Because we're taking the derivative of this function with respect to t. So what is the derivative of 4.9t squared? So d, the derivative of 4.9 t squared, all right? Well, that just becomes 2 times 4.9, so it's 9.8 t. Okay. And then from here, all we have to do is plug in 5 for t. So we would say 9.8 times 5, all right? And that's going to be equal to 45 times 8, 49. 49 what, though? Okay, well... Um, if my if my uh, s of t was in meters, right? Well, we're doing per, uh, our rate of change, so it's going to be meters per what? Seconds. Meters per seconds. Okay. And then lastly, c reads its uh, what is its acceleration after it has been fallen for five seconds? So we have to take the derivative of my derivative up here. The derivative of 9.8t is simply going to be 9.8. Okay, and at this point we see that we have no variable here, right? So it doesn't matter if it's been falling for five seconds, ten seconds, a million seconds. It doesn't matter. Its acceleration is going to be 9.8 meters per second, meters per second per second, right? And we know meters per second per second can be rewritten simply as meters per second squared. Okay. Um, I guess that's about it for that. Yeah. Okay. For some reason I forgot. I didn't think about 9.8. All right. And... This is just a little tidbit. I don't think I don't think it, uh, it I don't think it plays too much into the next two examples. But on Earth, objects fall at a constant rate uh, of acceleration at approximately 9.8 meters per second squared, which is what we have. Or you know, in in American units, 30, 32 feet per second squared. And this is called the gravitational constant, which is abbreviated as a G. Uh, I believe that's about. Oh. Um, also, if you're looking at an object's uh, velocity at any time as the slope of the tangent line at the point, if the object's speed speeds up, we know we, we, we graph it as going up. 
if it slows down, we graph it as going kind of curving downward, right? Um, these changes in velocity will appear as upward and downward bends, respectively, in the graph. And we're going to look at this in the graph here, right? And I think I think it does mention it, but these bends in the graph, they are where the um, where the rate of change changes, and which is the second derivative. And we'll talk about uh, inflection points. I think we'll talk about that in chapter three. I don't know why I told you. I'm just telling you now, though. <laughs> so, example four, analyzing velocity and, and acceleration graphically. So, Kimberly leaves her, house, her home, which is right here, right, the distance of zero, uh, for a 1.2 hour bicycle ride. The graph of her distance traveled with respect to time t is shown below. Okay. Now again, this is a bicycle ride, and it's uh, this this uh, vertical axis just denotes how far she's gone away from home. So obviously, if she's riding away from home, this graph is going to be going up, right? So that's that. Um, what else should I point out? That's about it. Yeah. Now I will say this seem this is a little tricky, and um, I'd say it's tricky because it's it's different from what you've seen, what you've uh, done when you've analyzed graphs before. And on top of that, it's just kind of hard to see. So let's let me see if I can just make this a little larger for you. That, that might help. I don't I don't know. Okay, but anyways, so um, this reads: find the intervals in which Kimberly is a traveling at a constant velocity. Okay. Now, a constant velocity, right, again, velocity, again, is the first derivative. The first derivative, again, is simply just the rate of change, and a constant velocity would, um, would appear as a straight line on a graph. Okay, straight line, uh, doesn't matter how, it's, how it is oriented, it is the fact that it is just simply straight. And what I mean by that is... Let's, again, it's kind of hard to tell, but notice how we're, all right, so, so the, these, these lines are broken off into sections. Okay, you can see that. So notice how this, this first part, it kind of bends upwards, right? It's not constant, right? However, um, this portion here, it's just simply a, um, a straight line like that, right? So it is constant. This line here, it kind of, hard to tell, but it kind of bends a little bit like this. Kind of bends a little bit. Notice how it's not just simply straight. So it's not constant. Obviously, this is constant. Same thing here, you know, kind of bends. So what my point is this. If I want to find out what where the velocity is constant, I'm just simply looking for these straight lines. Okay? And where do these straight lines exist? Well, again, it's really hard to see, but it looks like this line is straight. It looks like this line is straight, and it looks like this line is straight. Um, yeah. I mean, this kind of looks straight, too, but I don't know if we're going to be including that. Because right? it's not necessarily an interval, I mean, to infinity, but I mean, she's not riding a bike to infinity. And I don't think the textbook actually includes that either. Let me see. Yeah, it doesn't. Okay, so these are all our constant velocities. So the intervals on which she is traveling at a constant velocity it looks like it is from 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, from 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, and from 0 0.8 to 1.0. And that's all the intervals where, she, where, she, where she's traveling at a constant velocity. Okay. Well, if you made it this far into, into math courses, which you have because you're in this course, uh, certainly you know that, uh, well, I'm not even going to say that uh, because it kind of doesn't make sense for this. So scratch that thought. Uh, but accelerating, I mean, well, no, it is true. You, you would generally assume that acceleration is a graph that's just shooting up, right? And decelerating would be a graph that is, you know, not shooting up. Kind of, you know, you can see kind of how it's slowing down. 
and that's the same process here. So, so I, I, I hesitate to say this, but it is kind of common sense. You know, if, if we're accelerating, we're shooting upwards. If we are decelerating, we are obviously kind of we also, we obviously have kind of like a bend going down, right? So where are we accelerating? Well, it looks like this interval, uh, zero to zero point two, looks like we are we are accelerating, and you can it's hard to tell, but again, it looks like this interval looks like we are accelerating. So it looks like we're accelerating on intervals from zero to zero point two and from 0 0.6 to 0 0.8. And then lastly, where are we decelerating? And again, deceleration just appears as, well, the ones that are not constant and the ones that are um, not accelerating. Cool. So it looks like 0 0.3 to 0 0.4. and from 1.0 to 1.2. All right. So I uh, I personally think this is a horrible horrible idea of a graph, but that's just the way it is. All right. And lastly, what we're going to do I can't remember if it was this class or not, but we're going to go back to iPads. I sure hope it was this class. And that way only one class gets gets the whole iPad stuff. Alrighty, so business, tablet sales. The number of Apple iPods sold per year in millions, T years after 2010, can be approximated by the function N of T. Okay. Now, this is wanting us to um, also explain what these values represent. Okay, so... Hmm. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, so we want, um, this is what the problem is. I totally skipped over that. Sorry. So find n of 7, n prime of 7, and n double prime of 7, and explain what these values represent. Okay, so let's just find n of 7 real quick, and we're going to have to bust out the calculator. So n of 7, we're just going to write, so n of 7 is going to be, we plug in 7 everywhere, and... Uh, let's actually let's actually do this. Let's put n of seven up in this little hole. And I'm just going to I'm just gonna snip that first part. I mean I can obviously put in the calculator, obviously you can as well. Um but that's not the that's not the hard part of this problem. Okay, so uh, it, the problem does read up here. It says, um, explain what these values represent. Okay, so we want we first want to find n of 7. So n being the name of the function, so it's just n. It, it, it could have been t uh, of, of t, well, big T of t, you know, m of t, whatever. It's just n happens to be the, the name of the function. Well, we wanted to find out uh, the value of that function at t equals 7. But we were told that uh, t it represents years. So n of 7 means 7 years after after 2010, so in 2017, okay? So in 2017, if we plugged in 7 everywhere, again, this is just simple, simply plug in 7, just into the original equation, just the function uh, at 7. So we plug in 7, and we get 68.097, okay? So that means that in 2017, Apple sold approximately 68.097 million iPads. That's the easy part. Now comes the hard part. Now we need to find n prime of t. I'm sorry, yeah, n prime of t. So n prime of t is going to be, and, um, well, it's going to be 4.16t cubed minus, um, shoot, I was hoping I wouldn't have to do, that looks like 40, okay, yeah, sorry. We're just gonna have to do we're gonna have to do the, the math here. So we're just gonna take the 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 derivative here. Um, I guess I'll write this out. Four times zero point Ok, 
Okay, so I'm gonna run out of room. Um, I think. Well, no, we're not. Nice. Got saved by 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 common sense there, huh? So only because I know that the the constant at the end obviously doesn't have derivative. So if we clean this up, we're gonna have four times uh, point one oh six. So four two four. So zero point four two four t cubed minus three times one point four five two. 4.356, so minus 4.356 t squared, and then plus 1.9. Okay, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was, or thought as much as I thought it'd be. All right, so this is my first derivative. <clears throat> now we need to find uh, n prime of 7 raised, uh, I'm sorry, n prime, yeah, n prime of 7. So what is, what is n prime of 7. Well, we just have to plug in 7 everywhere where we see a t here. And I will snip that as well. Because again, this is just computation. Uh, calculator work here. And prime of 7. What's that? Okay, so we're asked to, we are asked to explain what these values represent. Well, the first one we said n of 7 is the number of iPads sold after 7 years. n prime of 7, okay, is that's the rate of change. Okay, so that means that in 2017, Apple's yearly sales uh, were increasing at a rate of 13.16 million units per year. Okay, and again, um, let's go back up here. Don't necessarily say it. But it's 68.097 units. Okay, that was the that was just a function. And then we take the first derivative. It is per year per unit. All right. And our unit in this particular case is years, so it's per year. And of course, you would could you would assume that the um, the last unit would be you know per year per year, right, or per year squared. And of course, we'll see that. Uh, but anyways, let's take the let's take the third derivative here. So let's go ahead and snip this. Uh, doesn't fit mainly because I don't write straight for some odd reason. Okay, so let's take the derivative of this. <coughs> okay. So if we take the derivative of of this, so let's ah, shoot. Let's fix that up. Let's try that one more time. <laughs> I write really crooked, don't I? So the derivative with respect to t of this, okay, and again, this is just going to be the second derivative, is going to be, uh, it's going to be a pain, that's what it's going to be. Okay, so 3 times 0 0.424 times t squared minus 2 times 4.356 times t and then our constant is just our constant so that's that's good um, and so therefore our derivative here second derivative is going to end up being 1.272 so let's do this uh, the second derivative of t is going to be 1.272 272 times t squared minus and then eight point seven one two times t. Okay. And something doesn't feel right about that one. Uh, 
Ha, oh, no. I... No, that's right. That's not right. What did, I, what did I skip? Did I skip a term? I think I did. Hmm. One moment. Uh, where is 11 at? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know it didn't, didn't sound right. Um, okay, so the the first derivative, which we which we did get, and then the second derivative, which we get, and then we had the 11. Did, did I write down the problem wrong? 3 and then t squared. I did. Dad government sure did. Okay, so that could be an issue. Thank you. So that is a big issue, actually. All right, so let's go ahead and... Well, hang on, let's see. Do we do we do we mess up that bad? Not necessarily. Um, okay, so what I, what I forgot to do, guys. I'm sorry. Is uh, this right here? I I just I differentiated straight from the uh, from this one to this one, and for some odd reason I skipped that one, and that's just the way it is. So, and of course it's not going to fit here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to snip. I'm just going to do some snipping here and put the problem on the notes. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. So our second derivative, if you would have done your first derivative correctly, uh, which is this is uh, which would be this. This is our first derivative. And again, uh, note the notation. We're taking the derivative of the derivative. And this is, uh, I don't know how I messed this up, but I did. Um, but it's, it's pretty easy, right? Th it's not, we're not doing any power rule, no chain rule, no, no quotient rule. It's just simply taking the derivative of each term. It's pretty easy stuff. And then, and then we plug in the number 7. Okay. And then we plug in the number 7. Well, we end up getting 12.662, okay? Now, what does that number mean? Obviously, you could read it here, but just think about it, and maybe the graph might help. Let's put the graph up, too. Okay. It's easy to think about the acceleration when you're thinking of, you know, how fast you're traveling, you know, for away from home on a bike, right? That It's easy to, to think of acceleration like that. Uh, however, when you think about the second-order derivative on a graph such as this, we're talking about the cells of the iPads here. Well, uh, th this is, I mean, I'm assuming, I mean, I'm obviously not in the business world, but I'm assuming that this is, this kind of helps you realize, okay, so while yes, we, we did, we, ha we are increasing our sales. Uh, if we're looking at the first derivative. Let's go back to the previous page. All right. So yes, we are improving our sales by 13.16, um, million units per per year that that's what we're increasing at right what what we're doing with the second derivative is again it's the the rate of change of our rate of change okay so this tells us that not only are our are, are, are cells improving but our cells are accelerating that means we are selling more every year true but we're selling more of those more right we it, it's the rate of change of the rate of change and in order, uh, I guess, I don't know if it helps or not, but in order to kind of wrap your mind around this, uh, we see that, um, okay, that's just the first graph, but yeah, we, we see that we're, we're accelerating, or, or we're, we're selling more iPads per year. Uh, that was the first derivative, 13.16, we're selling more iPads per year. That makes sense. But then when we throw in the, the, the second derivative, and again, I guess there's really no other way to say it, except for the two times I've already have, that is also accelerating. So that's what the, the first order and second order derivatives mean. And with that, that concludes today's lecture.